broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta. It's time for Customer Experience Radio, brought to you by Heineken Company, real estate advisors specialized in corporate relocation. Now, here's your host, Jill Heineck. Good morning, and welcome to this very special edition of Customer Experience Radio. I'm your host, Jill Hynek, and I'm a business owner, a real estate advisor, and a customer experience enthusiast. On our show, we talk to professionals who are dedicated to the customer experience, who understand that customer experience fundamentally changes the way it engages and interacts with customers. And today, especially in 2021, brands are facing intense pressure to stand for something bigger than the products and the services that they sell. So through both effective team empowerment and strategic thinking at the highest level, successful companies know that they can positively impact the customer experience with their brand, their team, and making loyal customers for life. So one person who has really stood out to me over the last several months um, as an avid giver of the goods on this topic is today's guest, Theo Gilbert Jameson. Theo is Chief Executive Officer for Performance Solutions by Design, a consulting firm headquartered in Atlanta that helps organizations across all industries exceed expectations by elevating the customer experience from average to ordinary. She's also the author of several popular leadership books uh, to include the six principles of service excellence. Prior to launching Performance Solutions by Design in in 2003, Thea was VP of Training and Organizational Effectiveness with the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company, where she enjoyed a successful 17-year career. Thea was also a contributor, instrumental in implementing and sustaining quality processes and systems that led to the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company becoming a two-time recipient of the renowned Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award. Welcome, Theo. Ah, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, so glad that we could finally connect and get you on the show because we have so much to cover today. Um, But I did want you to just give us, expound a little bit more on your transition from the um, your Ritz career into what you're doing now. Yes, thanks. And I love, you know, I absolutely love telling this story because it is uncoincidental. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, many years ago, I, I stumbled on, um, you know, working in the hospitality industry and working in all things customer experience, all things service excellence. Um, I started right out of college. I moved to Atlanta, Georgia. And my goal after graduating from college was to be a professional model. (laughs) I came up to work with a modeling agency and I did that for a couple of months. And, um, you know, because I was so new, I had to have a second job. Wouldn't make it enough to quite just do that. And a friend of mine said um, she worked at the Ritz Carlton in Buckhead and she said, go and apply. They're always looking for people. So I go down, I look at the list of things that they have available. And, um, you know, I was just out of college. I wasn't looking for any hotel profession. So I looked at the list and I said, okay, what can I do? And I, and, you know, I said, well, I'll be a housekeeper because I was only going to do this like for, you know, until my big modeling gig got going. (laughs) And so I go down to HR and I'm kind of like in a t-shirt and jeans because I wasn't expecting anybody to actually interview me. And um, when I walked in, all through college, I was a, um, a student assistant in um, human resources. So when I graduated, I, I didn't really think about that as being a career, but the interviewer saw that and said, oh, well, we're looking for, we need a, a secretary. We need someone part-time until we uh, can find our full-time person because you're not going to do housekeeping. I can tell you that right now. So I chuckled because <laughs> I really didn't know what was involved. And I started as a temporary in human resources at the Ritz-Carlton Buckhead in Atlanta. And I did it for 30 days and they still hadn't found anybody. And I had like good secretarial skills in typing and all that because I took all of that, you know, that was important at that time. And um, so I did it for 30 days. They didn't find anybody. I did it for another 30 days. And uh, my modeling, my modeling career was up and down. And they said, we really like you. Would you like to take this job? And I really had to think about it. And I said, you know what? They really treat people nice. I really like the whole feel of this. Yes. <laughs> and I started as a secretary in human resources, worked there 20 years, did every aspect of human resources, secretary, 
benefits manager, employment manager, assistant director of human resources, director, all the way up to vice president of learning and development uh, for the Ritz-Carlton worldwide. That was my last role that I did. Launched the Ritz-Carlton Leadership Center, did that for about three years. And then after that, I went on to doing other things, but it was just kind of like not coincidental at all. And that was just a PhD in customer experience. Oh, yeah. It was such a wonderful, tremendous um, opportunity. So that's how it all started. <laughs> and then when you transition, tell us a little bit about your transition from the Ritz Carlton to where you are now. Yes. Well, um, my last uh, couple of years, as I said, I was running the Ritz Carlton Leadership Center where people would come in because they wanted to learn all the secrets of the Ritz. And we would try and teach them, you know, our CEO always, always felt mm -hmm. like they're not going to do it all anyway. So just tell them. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so some companies would say, can you uh, come in and consult? Because we really want to take this to the next level. And when I went to my boss, who was the senior uh, VP of human resources, uh, she said, nah, we don't want to do that. And um, so that was fine. I was loving what I was doing, getting to travel all around the world and train and teach people around ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen. And um, when the organization was purchased by the Marriott Corporation, I decided that I wanted to, I just bought a house outside Atlanta, didn't want to have to relocate again. And I decided to part ways. And that's how I started with a couple of friends from Ritz Carlton. Uh, performance solutions by design. And that's what we did. We consulted and we still today consult organizations that want to raise the bar and elevate the customer experience from average to extraordinary. You know, they want an unparalleled, extraordinary service. And that's what we help organizations try to achieve. Okay. I love this. So that just parlays right into our next conversation, right? So uh -huh. um, talk to us a little bit about how, you know, what things are you doing can you that you can share um, to help companies do that? I mean, is there anything in particular that stands out to you at this moment um, that our listeners would really appreciate hearing from you regarding in that regard? Yeah, you know, um, prior to uh, the pandemic and so on, you know, organizations were kind of like on this strategic track where they want to elevate the customer experience. And I do agree for it to be sustainable, it's got to be more than just a nice smile class. Take everybody to a class, teach them how to smile. Right. We used to laugh and jokingly call it, take them to a kumbaya fest. Right. It's not sustainable. Right. So over the last 12 months I've been working on, you know, how do we create um, sustainability and um, help them to create this phenomenal level of service? So. I've been working on what I call getting to 90%, how to achieve and sustain 90% or higher customer satisfaction. And a lot of people laugh because they're like, that is not possible, Thea. <laughs> it's possible. But you know, it really is. It, it is. Jill, if you, I just was just looking at some statistics uh, day before yesterday that even today with all this benchmarking and all the, just all the information out there about how to elevate the customer experience, still most companies uh, at most, only experience around an average of 83% customer satisfaction. So, you know, that's kind of like, that's barely a B. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. That loyalty. So creating 90% or getting to 90%, that's my new claim to fame. <laughs> so give us an example of um, what you would advise a client to do or a tweak that they would have to make in their service delivery to reach yeah. that. It, it, it's, it's simple. And at the same time, it's, it's easy. You know, again, what organizations want to do is bring in some fancy person that wrote a book that can come in and do a quick one hour webinar. And in order really to create sustainable change, I think it starts with this is my process that I'm on to now is that an organization has to look at where are we today? Where are the gaps in our service uh, process today? Where do we want to be? What's the desired state? So that's number one. You know, so many organizations never actually use their services. So they don't realize how frustrating it is for a customer. You know, like, why are they upset? Why can't we get beyond 80%? Have you ever used your process? Especially <laughs> when you think about a lot of the, um, we've all been there. You know, technology is everything. You go on to order, you go on to do this and that. And sometimes, the process is so cumbersome right. that you're like, God, I wish I could just talk to a human being. 
So, you know, first you have to figure out where you are, where you want to go. Then the step, the next step is to kind of figure out where are the gaps, what's preventing you from getting there. Here's a big one I can tell you. A lot of people think that our gap is training. We just need to train everybody to be nicer. No, <laughs> that's important. But before that, and you know this, Jill, nobody, enough companies don't invest in selecting the right people. Right. If you start with selecting the right people, then guess what? The training and all the other stuff after that is so much easier. You know, think about how often you go to the grocery store. The cashier barely wants to smile. Mm -hmm. Why is she even there? <laughs> You've selected the wrong person. Everybody has a bad day. Right. But, you know, the selection process is a problem. So you identify your gap. You, you find out where you are today versus where you want to go. So let me back up one second. So yes. Would you would you say that a majority of the time it is the talent selection that is a majority of the problem? I think that's 50% of the time. Mm -hmm. The other 50% of the time is in effective processes. <laughs> right, which makes total sense. So if you yeah. don't have the right people and you don't have the right processes, well, obviously that's bad. Um, but then if you have the right people with the wrong processes, you still can't deliver. So... Yes. You know, one of the things that I always I, I love um, seeing, you know, what you've been posting lately about, you know, really working on building that and, and, and building a great team that can mm -hmm. deliver and that wants to deliver in a great way, but also, um, you know, empowering them to be able to do so. And yeah. And that, that that takes a long time. And I think companies are just like race, they feel like they're racing to get through things instead of just slow down, back up. The process is slow. And to be effective, you have to pull it apart and then so put it back true. together, right? So true. I'm working with a wonderful healthcare organization right now. And um, we've been doing a gap analysis and all along, the CEO thought that, oh, my people just aren't nicer. They just need to be nicer. The kindest people I have ever worked with. And what we're finding out is that there's some processes that need to be uh, that are inefficient and ineffective so that it doesn't matter how nice and kind the person is. If the processes are flawed, bless their heart, the customer is still going to be frustrated and dissatisfied. And so is the the. So is the team trying to, 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 to use it? I mean, that's, that's why they're not happy and smiling. <laughs> yes. You're so right. So right. So, so um, so I know we, so that leads kind of into um, what you and I are both passionate about and that's employee empowerment. And, um, and so let's talk a little bit about what you're doing in that space right now. Is there any, are you, um, do you have any particular special programs that you implement or is there um, a process like a Theo's brands, you know, uh, program that you share with clients when they're really trying to um, get their teams excited about their service delivery or just to elevate their service delivery? Yeah, I love that because, you know, um, as you said, empowerment is so important. I have a program, I call it um, the art of listening, because that's important. We'll talk about that in, more, in a moment. But, but the art of listening, employee empowerment and effective service recovery. Because right. to effectively reser re re resolve an issue, the person has to listen. And, and that we can go in, down so many rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. Most people don't have good listening skills. So that's an issue. Mm -hmm. Secondly, most people just aren't properly trained so that they can be empowered to resolve an issue. Let me give you an example that everybody has heard of before. You know, Ritz Carlton. I don't know if you hear this too much today, but when I was there, People always raved about the fact that, wow, Ritz-Carlton empowers people up to $2,000 right. to resolve an issue before going to a manager. Right. How right. are they not bankrupt? <laughs> but they weren't bankrupt because a lot of training and development went into that and process improvement um, so that you fix the problem because if, an, if a customer has an issue or problem, everybody's taught, apologize. <laughs> Right. Apologize right. and give them something so they'll come back. So you apologize, right. you give them a dozen roses, but then guess what? Next time they come back, the problem's still there. Right. So right. with empowerment, not only you are you empowered, I think you should be empowered to go ahead and take care of that issue, um, but you should also be empowered to resolve it so it doesn't happen again. Because right. companies right. lose a lot of money, I can tell you, on refunding, 
and rebating and giving away gifts because you know they've messed up and nobody ever goes back to look at how can we fix that. Absolutely. When we had Horst on, uh, Horst Schulte on in um, March of, I think it was last, no, the year before. Wow. Uh, yeah, because last year was a pandemic. Um, that's when the pandemic started. But he, when he launched his book, he he actually did go into deeper detail on the empowerment piece and why I think that is one reason why um, Ritz has been so uh, successful and mm-hmm. why people keep coming back because they know, God forbid, if, you know, the one example he gave us was um, uh, a guest had left their laptop in the room and the employee like literally got on a plane and flew out to Hawaii to return the laptop. I mean, that's insane. Yes. <laughs> but that is such an amazing example of elevating that process and giving that employee and that guest that boost. And I'm so lucky to have worked with him. I'm glad that you mentioned uh, Horst Schulte because my entire 17 years, he was there too. And I love that, you know, he was so humble um, in his leadership. He probably said this too. He would often tell us, we're the best of a lousy lot. Mm-hmm. He would say, you know what? On a scale of one to five with five high, we're probably about a uh, three, but thank God the competition is a one or two. <laughs> this was at our pinnacle, Jill. This is at all our right. pinnacle when we're winning Malcolm Baldrige Awards and all this kind of great stuff. But guess what? That kept us humble and that kept our eye on the mark that, you know what, at any time you can do something to create customer dissatisfaction that will disintegrate Mm -hmm. (laughs) all of that loyalty and all that good stuff. So it only takes one, right? So it takes a lifetime to build your reputation and create a customer for life, but it takes one bad experience. And with social media now, it can just crush you. Yes. God, I love you. Can we just talk forever? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's, you know, the basis of my business has always been about, you know, we are helping people transition in life. And whether it's with a job, you know, buying and selling homes with a job, relocating, etc. It's a very, it's a very touchy experience. And so we want to make sure that, you know, every step of the way, we are aware of that. We're listening every step of the way, which to your point, the art of listening, I mean, that is, that's key in any business. But um, what we're finding more and more now, particularly during pandemic times with the concerns of um, health and safety, you're really having to listen to the client say, you know what, I don't want people coming in and out of my house. So yes. what's the what's the process that you're going to implement to prevent that from happening? So um, I think it's, uh, I mean, most companies are really challenged with um, finding people to A, do the work and B, be excited about evolving as a team player. So I think, you know, in my business also, when we're trying to hire, I mean, it's, it's not easy to find that person who comes with, comes packaged well in terms of, you know, you were talking earlier, it's hard to like, you know, identify nice people, right? So most people inherently are nice. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They want to, they want to be in a nice environment. Yes. And are you giving them that nice environment? You just made a point that it was so nice to work at the Ritz, um, at the Ritz Carlton Company. So I think about that. You know, you have to create the culture that people want to be in there. That will bring the nice out. (laughs) I agree with that. Right. Along with all the other things you mentioned, like training and development and giving them the tools and the processes that are going to actually make the experience for them and for the customer an extraordinary one. So, um, I want to talk about, you know, where are you taking or how are you advising your clients right now on, you know, taking it to that extraordinary experience? Um, Like, for example, are you working with mainly service companies? Are you working with um, point of sale? Like, where where are you? What kind of uh, companies are you working with and how are you how are you coaching them there? Yeah, you know, I'm fortunate that I am working everywhere. Mm -hmm. I when we started the company, we were focused mostly on hospitality and retail uh, because those are very front facing. Um, But I've been a lot in healthcare, a lot with private country clubs, a lot of technology and manufacturing. You Mm -hmm. know, sometimes people think, well, in manufacturing and technology, you're not dealing specifically with um, the customer. So you don't have to worry about that. But guess what? We have internal and external customers. And and these are great companies that realize that. Um, One thing I learned, and this is what they realized too, when I was in human resources, 
uh, or when I first started, you know, my career, I thought, oh, I don't have any customers because I'm working in HR. <laughs> I'm only working with the employees. But then spoiler alert, somebody said one day, guess what? They're, they're, they're your customers. customers too. You have internal and external customers. You should treat everybody with the highest level of dignity and respect. So, you know, we're walking, we're working in all industries because as Horst probably said too, um, because, and I'd say some things he says because I've worked with him for 17 years, but that the same customer that stays in a luxury hotel is the same customer that has, goes to the doctor, goes to the bank, goes to the gas station, <laughs> buys technology. So these are all the same people. So for, you know, for someone to say, oh, well, we're not a hotel. I used to hear that quite a bit. Eh, mm -hmm. Theo, we like your stuff, but we're not a hotel. Doesn't matter. Mm -mm. Service is service. And when you get to a point that regardless of whatever your product or service is, you try to provide an unparalleled experience that's personalized for that customer, they're going to be a customer for life. Mm -hmm. You know, just like you said, you know, it only just one negative interaction and 50% or more of people will never come back again. Yeah, you know? people are very testy these days, right? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Listen, and I'm not excluded from that. I mean, you know, it's like I've been a customer of yours for X amount of years. And then that one uh -huh. interaction where that in particular employee treated me like dirt. Yep. I mean, I don't understand that. Obviously, it's a management problem. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's a quality control problem. I get all that. And and sometimes, you know, I've got to give grace where grace is due. And I give myself grace and I have to give others grace. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to your point, I mean, that that could ruin it, could could yeah. ruin it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, if you don't mind pivoting a little bit, um, you know, we hear so much about um, service versus um, experience. Mm -hmm. And I've always been an experienced person, yes. um, much less ex service. And, and it's funny, I don't know if you've ever listened to Clark Howard, but he always talks about customer no service. Yeah. <laughs> and I laugh because a majority of companies, unfortunately, that's where they live in customer uh -huh. no service. Um, <laughs> so how do you differentiate service and experience with your clients? And, you know, what's important about that? Well, this is a great question. Wow. You asked some good questions. <laughs> when I think about customer service versus a customer experience, you know, customer experience is kind of like the, in, in three more years, it'll be another word. <laughs> right. Customer service used to be, you know, acceptable. Now we're saying, then we move to service excellence. Now it's customer experience. But when I think about customer service versus customer experience, because that's what you asked. To me, customer service is like a department that you call when you have a problem. And that's where Clark Howard says you get customer no service. Right. To me, customer service is, you know, they, they just do the minimum, meet your expectations, comply with your needs, you know, just do enough just to get by. But do they, do they meet your expectations? No, <laughs> because guess what? No, because <laughs> the customer experience is where you don't just do enough to meet the, just meet the and comply, but where you exceed expectations. Right. Exceeding is just doing a little bit more, you know, um, just doing a little bit more. Maybe you use that person's name. Maybe you remember something that they liked from the last time that they came so that you personalize it. It's being accommodating and flexible. You know, if someone has an issue, not saying, no, that's not our policy. So uh, an experience is saying, well, you know, I apologize, we can't do that, but let me see what we can do. Or here is something that might help you. An experience just takes it to the next to the next level. It's something that people remember, okay? Memorable experience is what's coming to mind. Customer service is just, oh, blase. Yeah, that was okay. You know, it, it to me too, without um, extending too long on this, it's kind of like customer satisfaction versus customer loyalty. Right. Satisfied customer. You know, 80%, yeah, I'm satisfied, okay. mm -hmm. but loyal is 90% or higher. And when you have customers with that level of, of satisfaction, they will not easily be swayed by the competition. I love that. And I, and, and that just, I love what you just said. Um, and that brings me to what your coined term here, which I picked up from you is the effective service recovery, mm -hmm. um, which that to me is, you know, kind of lands in the service department, but yes. it could be avoided if it was already elevated um, and the team was already thinking experience versus service. 
Yes. You could avoid this altogether, but let's talk a little bit about your effective service recovery. I was reading okay. your, uh, on your posts and, and going through all that. And I, I just love it. And that's, this is exactly not everybody, not every professional, not every company believes in this. Yes. Right? Um, but this has been since day one, I'm 22 years in the real estate business. And my very first contract, I made a d mistake in the contract and I, I, you know, I was just, okay, well, I had to raise my hand after, you know, a week of crying and say to my customer, I made a mistake and I need to let the other parties know, but I understand that this could be my first commission as good night because I have to pay for that mistake, but stepping up to that and owning up to it and then already creating the solution to say, look, I'm just going to let them know I'll, I'll cover it. And, um, and let me tell you, when when the other parties came back and they heard that, you know, I said that I made the mistake, I understand the commissions on the line, they all came back and all four of us split it four ways. And it was my client's suggestion to do it. So yes. I think it's, you know, part of this effective service recovery is mm -hmm. owning up to it, exactly. which some companies, you know, the customer isn't always right. Yep. This is funny. They say that Cesar Ritz, who was the person that developed the Ritz at the early 19 or 18, late 1800s, they say that he coined the phrase that the customer is always right <laughs> in his own mind. <laughs> I thought oh. that was so funny. <laughs> no, but at the same time, you, the customer is right. What I love is that you took ownership and in do, you apologized, you took ownership. And what in doing that, instead of placing blame, in right, doing right. that, you actually regain their loyalty and trust right. to the extent that they're like, no, we're not going to let you suffer because of this. <laughs> right. Well, and then they went on to, to, to buy, you know, we did four or five additional sales after that. Yes. So that just really was incredible to me because I thought for sure that was the end of that story. And mm -hmm you know, three years later, I get a call and, and five later years later after that, I get a call. So um, I think it's just showing your commitment to the process, commitment to them. You listened, you understood that, you know, I made a mistake. I just got to own up to it. Um, but I also think that, you know, at a very early stage in my business, I was already focused on the experience and I did not want them to leave with a bad taste in their mouth, to feel like they'd been duped, to feel like, I wasn't paying attention. Yes. And, and that I think is lacking in a lot of companies right now. They're paying the attention. The problem with so many companies is that they automatically, oh, we're going to lose money, <laughs> but right. you gained, you gained. And you know what? But and they have, it's like looking that, at the long game, right? For life. Yes. They're short-sighted, right? So yes. I always have looked at the long game you're doing, you're building your business and you can't worry about churning and burning. You have to pay attention to the process you're in now. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and I, I, and I understand that every company wants to continue to have, you know, customers banging the door down, you know, you want that funnel filled, you want people to continue to call you and come with, but you have to take care of the ones you're with today so that they'll keep coming back. So you don't have to worry about continually spending money on getting new business. Exactly. Right. So, you know, in a nutshell, what you did, it's a four step process. Um, the first thing is a, if a customer has an issue or a problem, the first thing is that you listen without interrupting, you know, allow them to vent. Sometimes in their venting, they'll say, Jill, I don't want anything. I don't, I just don't want this to happen again. So often we're, while people are venting, we're already in fix it mode. We don't even have to fix it. Right. So first is to listen. The second is to always empathize. The ability to put yourself in that person's shoes, which mm -hmm. I'm sure you did, mm -hmm. you know, wow, if, I, if that were me, what would I want done? To empathize. And empathy can be as simple as, I apologize. I'm so sorry that that happened. If that's, the, you know, depending mm -hmm. on the incident. If you empathize, typically that brings a person's temperament down. Mm -hmm. Ever had someone screaming to the top of their lungs mm -hmm. and over something that's very minute. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you empathize, I'm so sorry. I could understand why you might be upset. Let me see what I can do. Guess what they do? They come down. Right. Oh, Theo, I'm so, it's not you. It's just that today this happened and that happened before this. And I'm just still, right. I apologize. Right. I didn't mean to yell at you. So right. we listen, right. we empathize. This is the tricker, tricky one that I teach in service recovery. Ask, 
how can I fix this for you? Now, people get scared because they're afraid, oh my God, they're going to want the whole thing for free now. 90% of people don't. 90% of people say, I don't know. I just want you to fix it. <laughs> right. But if you, but if they've told you, sometimes they've already told you, so that it, it could also be act. Here's how I'm going to resolve this for you. I apologize. Here's what I'm going to do to resolve it and then produce that solution. And I always say, follow up. This is where a lot of customers in service recovery or a lot of companies stop. Even after you listen, you empathize, you ask how you can fix it, you fix the problem. The last thing is to follow up with them a few days later to ensure it's been resolved to their satisfaction. That's right. Because sometimes that's the problem is that I, I, I half listen. So I gave you something for free, which you didn't care about. Right. <laughs> so it didn't mean anything to you. Um, and so you're still disgruntled, dissatisfied, upset. You're going to badmouth me. And like you said, with technology and social media, that's real easy to do. Right. If you follow up. You have the ability to come back and say, um, Miss Jones, last week this happened and we did this. I just want to follow up to make sure everything is OK. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. That's like the icing on the cake. You have okay. created a customer for life now. Right. And not right. only are they your customer for life but they're more likely to tell other people about you, even though you made a mistake. Right. Tell more people about you, buy more from you, recommend you, all that great stuff. They're also giving, again, it comes back to grace. They're giving you grace. You owned up to your mistake. Everybody makes mistakes. We're human beings. And so to your point, when you are following up, they realize, okay, they, they took notice of me. They made a note. They made an effort to call me back. And yes. even if the response was, you know what, no, nothing really changed. And, you know, I'm still not happy. It still gives you an opportunity to try again. Yes. And, and sometimes you get shut down, but at least you made the effort. And I think even then someone's still going to refer the business because there was that effort made on the back end. And so many people don't, this is what makes you such a superstar. So many people in their companies, you have problems, they're already blaming. That was HR's fault. That was accounting's fault. They don't care. Right. So, okay, that's red, that's a, that's tech off number one, bad, bad experience. They mm -hmm. don't empathize, you know, they don't ask you how they can fix it. They have produced a solution that's not going to cost them any money because they're so afraid they're going to lose a few dimes. Right. Then nobody ever follows up. So if you follow that simple process, I mean, you just, you become such a superstar. That's why I say getting to 90% is not as difficult as, as people think. It's just consistency around a couple of simple things. Number one is kindness and respect. Smile, be kind. To be another kind human being, to a human, just yes. remember the human beings on the other side like you. Exactly. So true. So you know, I totally agree with that. Um, one of the things that we've implemented um, and that we've been training our team on is just from the listening perspective is when you're in that initial stage with that customer or client, we're, we're asking them questions like, how do I win with you? You know, we want you to shout our names from the rooftop when, when mm -hmm. we're done working together on this particular transaction. So how do I win with you? And then tell me, how do I lose with you? Yes. You know, what things, you know, really it. make you crazy. Mm -hmm. And then how do you prefer to be communicated with? I know with online businesses, like, for example, you know, our friends at Amazon, everything's online. But I'll tell you, my experience with customer, their customer service department has been stellar over their, you know, their texting and their texting mm -hmm. customer service process has been stellar. So, and they said, how else can I help you? And then a day later, I'll get another call or email. How? How was that? Are you okay with it? Will you now rate us? Um, so, you know, sometimes you don't have a choice on how you're going to be communicated with, but in my case, you are. And then we talk about, you know, look, if this experience isn't working out um, for either one of us, and, you know, we figure that out in the first, you know, month of working together, then, mm -hmm. you know, either one of us can say, you know what, this isn't working for me. L let's, let's, let's go our separate ways. You know what that does? It sets you up for like, wow, they're being transparent. They care about how I feel. This is going to go, you know, and, you know me, 99% of the time, that's not going, you know, we're together, we're together yes. to the end. But the fact <laughs> that they have the option, God forbid, that they're not feeling comfortable in the situation, they don't feel locked down, it's not going to be this big knockdown drag out to get out of the contract. So I think, you know, every business is different. And that's just mm -hmm. the way we work. Um, and not every company can do it that way. But I think, you know, to your point, like, that's where we're going with elevating that customer experience so that they feel like, you know, this is somebody who is this is a company who's paying attention. 
and, and invested if I can in me. Add to that because so often, you know, one thing that I talk about, you're actually showing how you demonstrate it is personalizing the experience because then you make a person feel valued. Mm-hmm. And just in asking those questions, that helps down the road so that you know their likes, their dislikes. How do they like to be communicated? Do they want text? Do they want a phone call? Do they want an email? All of those are things that help you just to connect a little bit closer with that client or that customer by personalizing that experience. That's another just big way to to move on the trajectory of achieving 90%. Achieving and then and then you have to look at keeping those things going so that it's sustained. Absolutely. I, I mean, we could go on for days about this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but one thing, um, so kind of just to kind of bring everything around full circle here. Um, when you talk about um, listening and being genuinely focused on what the person is saying and not interrupting them, I think that is that in and of itself is huge. And I think, you know, this quote by Maya Angelou, which is amazing, and I'm oh, sure you've heard it a million times, yes. but I've learned <laughs> that people will forget what you said, yes. forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And, yes. you know, you could have had a complete meltdown with this client, or they could have had a complete meltdown when they're talking to you. But in the end, you've provided solutions, and then they will feel validated and yes. will want to come back to you even after the meltdown. And I just have to keep that... Um, that quote in front of me so often, I just, yeah. I have it on my phone. I have it on my laptop. I have it on my wall. Mm-hmm. And you just, I just have to think continually think about that and then put myself in that position. How would yes. I feel if I were them? You know, it's all about how people feel. Mm-hmm. Like you said, so many times the customer, we're not perfect. The customer doesn't expect us to be perfect, but they do expect us to fix things immediately when they go wrong. Right. And I think about how often if you just listen, empathize, you know, uh, make them feel valued, how you, again, regain that. And you make sure that that thing doesn't happen again. <laughs> right. That problem. The shipping was wrong. They got charged too much. Some other employee was a little abrupt with them. You know, you just make sure that doesn't happen again. That listening is just so important. You know, with listening, one of the things that I realized too, and we teach this, is that um, when it comes to listening and service recovery, people want instant, instant. Let's hurry right. up and fix this because I got five other clients on the line. I don't want to hear them ramble and vent. You know, we listen at a speed, I think, of about, well, we speak, people speak at a speed, I think, of about 125 words. That's the way I want per minute. But we listen and comprehend and process at about 400 words a minute. So we're processing and comprehending so much quicker than the person can explain it that sometimes we have, a, a because of that, that's a talent and a curse, but because <laughs> of that, we have a tendency to cut them off because we already know how to fix it. And like you say, feeling, feeling valued means that sometimes you just let them go ahead and, blend, and vent and get it all out. And once they've done that, sometimes they're apologizing to you, you know, then you fix, you make sure you resolve that. Because again, um, in my, in my, you know, years in hospitality, I can think of how many times someone's room service was late or this happened or that happened. We messed up their dry cleaning, their laptop is missing, this, that, you know, we'd apologize and we'd fix, you know, we'd apologize. We'd send them some cookies or a bottle of wine or, you know, something, but we never fix the problem. So they come back next week, it happens again. So as a part of service recovery, that issue has to be, or that process has to be fixed. Where's the gap in the process that's causing dissatisfaction and, and, and so on. And I just keep honing on that because so many organizations and, and leaders think that, oh, we just take them through Theo's training because they love that. They had such a great time in the training. And, you know, even the best person, um, if the processes are flawed, I think it was Deming that said that 80% of issues in any organization is processes, not people. Right. You know, so listening, fixing the process, personalizing the experience, we could go on and on. That's why you have this lovely show, because there's so (laughs) much on this. (laughs) There's so much to cover. And really, it is... um... It's a, it really is a passion of mine because I think that now I think more and more companies are making it a priority. And so you have been such an incredible 
guest. I so much appreciate your time. Um, and I know that this is, um, our listeners have enjoyed you so much. I know that they have preemptively speaking. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone for listening. I'm proud to share this show with you as these tips prioritize the customer experience as a legit business strategy. Hear that everyone? It's a legit business strategy, reminding us that no matter the business you're in, whether it's consulting, food service, hospitality, or real estate, the customer experience should always be the heart of the business. 